Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Chat, a conversation series dedicated to our interconnectedness. It's an uplifting moment when we can turn our thoughts to spiritual ideas. Each session is rooted in the Baha'i writings and the fundamental teachings of the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of mankind, led by individuals who are putting these principles into action. I'm Laila Mopayan, standing in for David Hoffman as co-host today, and I'm delighted to introduce two of my good friends who have both been putting Baha'i principles into action in some very inspiring and compelling ways. I'd first like to introduce Masood Olafani, an Atlanta-based multidisciplinary artist, actor, and writer of considerable renown who you may recognize as my co-curator on the recent Baha'i Chat racial justice series, Still in Progress. Masood has exhibited his work in group and solo shows, both nationally and internationally. He's the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including a South Art Prize State Fellowship, a MOCA Working Artist Project Grant, and a Southwest Airlines Art and Social Engagement Grant. He's a former artist in residence at the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center. His writing has been featured in Scalawag Magazine, Burn Away, Baha'i Teachings, and he was a contributing writer for the Jacob Lawrence Struggle Series catalog published by the Peabody Essex Museum. He's the co-host of Retro Report on PBS a primetime investigative news show that looks at news events through the lens of history. You might also like to check out his racial justice podcast, America's Most Challenging Issue. I'd also like to introduce Derek Smith, who is a professor in the Department of Literature at Claremont McKenna College, where he's also chair of the Intercollegiate Department of Africana Studies at the Claremont Colleges. He writes about American literary culture with a particular interest in poetry. His current scholarship addresses the poetics of rap, and the rise of the genre during the final decades of the 20th century. He also teaches courses in and about American prisons. In recent work, Derek explores the connection between critical race studies and the Baha'i faith, and his 2019 article, Centering the Pupil of the Eye, Blackness, Modernity, and the Revelation of Baha'u'llah in the Journal of Baha'i Studies should be required reading. His new book, Robert Hayden in Verse, New Histories of African-American Poetry in the Black Arts Era just came out, and I encourage all of you to check it out. Today's program on Robert Hayden is dedicated to his daughter, Maya Hayden Patillo, who just passed away this week. Today's conversation will begin with the recitation of Robert Hayden's poem, Those Winter Sundays by Masood Olafani. Those Winter Sundays. Sunday too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue, black, cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made, banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking when the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Uh, thank you, friends, for joining us uh, for what I know will be an engaging conversation. Thank you, Laylee, for that generous introduction. Brother Derek, uh, good to see you as always, man. Happy to uh, be in this space with you to uh, hopefully shed some light on, I think, um, far too often is an overlooked uh, and extremely important person, uh, not only in the terms of um, arts and letters here in America and across the globe, but also in terms of what he represents um, as a creative person uh, trying to, and struggling to walk a spiritual path uh, through incredibly difficult times. Um, I, you know, I, as I'm thinking about Robert Hayden and, and, and reflecting on his life, I, the first question I was, as I was thinking about our discussion today was, given the moment that we're in, right, when we're dealing with all of this, um, all of these issues um, that are centered around the ongoing dilemma of race. Um, we've seen these, de these deaths in the streets, which continue to 
uh, unfortunately and tragically happen, and which are tied to a legacy of violence visited upon the black body um, throughout history, throughout the 401 years of people of African descent being in this country. And I'm thinking about um, Hayden and how his uh, subject matter um, and the types of issues that he was wrestling and dealing with uh, kind of fit with the moment that we're in. And so my first question is, um, is uh, why Hayden and why now? First, let me just thank you, Masu, for inviting me to speak with you here today. And also thanks to Laylee for the introduction. And hearing your recitation of those winter Sundays is really a beautiful thing because it deserves a kind of oratory like the one that you can give it, you know. And so, you know, you capture so wonderfully the depth and the breadth of Hayden's cadences and the vision that he brings into the poetry mm -hmm. and one of the things that i think is notable about the poem that you just read those winter sundays is the way in which it's voiced from the position of an adult speaker looking back upon his childhood right and this is one of the things that hayden explored from the african-american perspective at an earlier stage than almost any other major artist intellectual. And what I mean by that is the, the relationship between the present and the past, mm -hmm. the way in which the past is always impinging on the present. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in a whole variety of poems that Hayden produced, and you can feel it in this poem so powerfully, right? And those final lines, what did I know, what did I know yeah. of love's austere and lonely offices. I mean, just so, I mean, those are some of the most powerful lines in American yeah. poetry. Um, and one of the things that it does is it kind of gives us this feeling that it's almost too late to do what should have been done, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the way in which our past is so shaping of our present and the way in which we can't escape that. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we go to Hayden's poetry, we see this concept again and again, the way in which our past is inextricable from our present, which will of course lead into our future. And what we see with Hayden is some of the earliest real grappling work with the legacy of slavery right, mm -hmm. with the way in which the origins of the relationship between blackness and what we call the modern world are so tied into that experience of what we call new world slavery. Mm -hmm. And Hayden was one of the first people to really go deeply into that, using his art as a means of exploration. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, there's so many reasons why Hayden now Mm -hmm. Right. But that historical consciousness is one of the really important elements uh, mm -hmm. that Hayden sort of he, he, he brings that into the American cultural tradition in such a powerful way, beginning in the 1940s up until his death in 1980. Man, that that you're bringing up so many powerful um, ideas that I think are so important, this kind of intersectionality of the present moment with the past. Right. And. Um, I'm thinking of, 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 of obviously Hayden's life as being an example of one who was always wrestling with the past, wrestling with his own personal narrative, his own personal history, also the collective narrative of people of African descent, and then also the global narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I think a good place to kind of, as we're talking about the past, is maybe to, uh, you know, drift back a little bit, you know, to 1913 when he's born. Um, you know, and, um, and growing up, um, you know, in, in, in a place like Paradise Valley, you know, um, also called Black Bottom in Detroit, you know, an impoverished uh, African American community um, full of its personalities and um, characters as all communities are. Um, and we know from, you know, his narrative, from his story, um, you know, that, that he had a very difficult childhood. I mean, um, he is born into one family, uh, 
and then he is uh, essentially um, adopted by another family, which is, uh, and he takes the name, the surname of that family, which is Hayden. I mean, he's born Bundy Sheffy uh, in Detroit, Michigan. And, um, and we know that his adopted family was a very difficult environment. There was violence in the home. We know there was violence visited upon him. We also know that he suffered from, um, you know, having poor vision, poor eyesight. So he was not an athlete. And um, because of that, and in some, in some sense, his kind of taking this deep dive into literature in the books makes sense because he was in some ways isolated and marginalized because of him having poor vision. So he has this kind of, he represents in some ways the, this intersectionality of, um, of multiple marginalities, right? He is a black boy in an impoverished uh, area of the country who also has this, this other challenge of having poor insight, poor uh, vision. And uh, so he's, you know, marginalized thrice or three times in a way, in a sense, right? And um, I just, I, I was wondering if you could, talk about that, that intersection, this other intersection which takes place between um, Black genius or genius expressed through the prism of Blackness intersecting with um, impoverished and marginalized communities and how those communities, in spite of their marginalization, are able to give birth to this amazing, um, you know, um, just collection of artists and creatives who have tremendous impact um, on the world. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little bit, brother. Yeah, that's such a beautiful description of Hayden's, his matrix, if you will, like the, the, the origin story of Hayden gives us a lot of insight into his, into his work and into his genius, like you're pointing out. And of course, I think from that position of marginality, there are a whole array of geniuses that can be produced, right? There are those who um, sort of are able to inhabit that environment and channel its beauties in a way which can be particularly appreciated in that environment itself, right? But we look at Hayden and what we see is a continual figure of alienation, right? He is alienated in so many different ways, right? From his original family, right? Within his adopted family, then from his community, and then from other children by these thick glasses that he had to wear to compensate for that impaired vision that you talked about, right? So I think Hayden's genius arose in that context by his desire to understand it, mm -hmm. but also to, because of his distance from it, if you see what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't totally at ease in that context, right? He had that kind of fragmented sense of identity, which can oftentimes lead to a kind of incredible genius yeah. that is harnessed in order to work out the alienation, mm -hmm. work out the fragmentation. And what we see in Hayden's art, right, is this kind of struggle to use an art form that for the most part would have been alien in that Paradise Valley context which he grew up in, right? If you see, if we look back again to that poem, Those Winter Sundays, mm -hmm. that father, that adopted father who both loved him and abused him is incredibly distanced from the speaker or in the poem, right, because the speaker is so erudite and articulate, whereas the father is a laboring man who doesn't know how to even express his love in words, whereas Hayden is a master of words, right? And so that distance from a kind of working class neighborhood who, in which the literary arts might not have been so deeply appreciated, yeah. right, is yeah. a kind of uh, wonderful thing about Hayden. He's trying to express that and understand that originary context using an art form which he had to learn about from outside that neighborhood, right? So it's as though he's bringing these two experiences together and in the intermingling and the clashing of those experiences, this genius emerges. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful to me because I'm thinking, you know, I, 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 looking at his story and I'm thinking about, 
you know, all of the other uh, amazing um, creatives of African descent who have come out of neighborhoods like that, um, where they are struggling against the blight of poverty, a, a blight of their, their color, their cultural context, and who yet and still are able to rise and create these incredible art forms, whether they express through the literary word, through musicality, through, you know, dramatic arts, through dance and movement, or through painting the visual arts as well. And it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's inspiring in a sense. There's something really redemptive, you know, about, about that experience, that trajectory. Um, mm -hmm. There's an aspect of it that is kind of like harkens back to this kind of Horatio, you know, Alger kind of tale, you know, in a way, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, mm -hmm. even though we know that um, the black community historically has had no bootstraps to pull themselves up by. So that in a sense makes it even more profoundly um, redemptive and miraculous that he is able to come out of those circumstances and make the profound contribution that he's able to make. And I'm thinking about, you know, as we're having this discussion, I'm so inspired by what you're saying. I, I, I'm thinking about this idea of vision, right? Of being able to see, which in, in, in the context of Hayden, is you know is really interesting right because in the you know with, within the framework of the baha'i um faith people of african descent are referred to as the pupil of the eye right that the light enters the eye through the pupil right so our ability to see is made possible because of that pupil right so and that and, and that vision is both material and also spiritual so hayden is impaired on the material side mm but he seems to be able to tap into a spiritual vision in a very deep way and then to articulate it because of his gift, his innate ability, that, which is honed through training and to give us this vision of a world in a very profound um, and, 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 and deeply resonant way, right? That kind of elevates our collective ability to see, um, you know, this context. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the irony of that, you know, that how that kind of is, is stitched together in a way. Mm. Yeah, you said a lot in there that's really, you know, fascinating and I think important. And one of the things that I want to uh, sort of pull out from what you just said, right, is the honing of the craft, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not as though Hayden or any other person just emerges spontaneously with this kind of creative gift that's unhoned, right? That, you know, sometimes there are these ways of, uh, fetishizing black creative ability as though it comes innate and it's just natural right and that then kind of uh, neglects the incredible work that people put into their crafts right and of course Hayden was as committed and as dogged as any literary creator that there was in terms of his commitment to creating the best art that he could right so on the one hand right it is this it, there's this kind of almost mystical element of creative vision that is born out of hardship right that is born out of um material lack yeah. which is then compensated for seemingly by creative mass if yeah. you will right um and so on the one hand we have that sort of polarity working but then i think you're so it's so wise to bring in like just don't think that that's some kind of reflexive organic operation that happens without people putting in incredible work hayden was one of these people that put in incredible work he studied so much he read everything he was so observant right and if we go back to that um that kind of observational quality that we had, then I think we can tie that back to perhaps the black experience in uh, modernity, right? Um, when you are deprived of certain kinds of sensory uh, apparatus, as Hayden was, right? You must then compensate for that deprivation yeah. using other means, right? Yeah. So if Hayden wasn't quite able to uh, participate in the world like other young people could, and if he was separated by it from these uh, very thick glasses, mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he was, in fact, he was nearly blind, right? He had to develop these observational qualities mm -hmm. uh, that made his work so profound and so powerful. In a way, he developed what we could call like a second sight. Yes. Right. And this is a this is a kind of ancient idea within mm -hmm. human cultures. Right. That one who is deprived of 
uh, the capacity for normal vision, right, is then endowed with a yeah. kind of mystical ability to yeah. see things that others can't. Mm -hmm. W.E.B. Du Bois attributed that same kind of second sight to African American people at large as a community, right? Yeah. Being deprived of certain capacities uh, for freedom within the American context for being recognized as fully human, mm -hmm. then Black people had to develop a understanding of their world and their social context, and particularly uh, those things that could bring people through mm -hmm. difficulty and hardship in yeah. a way that other communities were not forced into, yeah. right? Yeah. So maybe um, the second sight, mm -hmm. which is a capacity that we can see uh, working in African American communi communities and which has been honed yes. by certain artists, right? Maybe that emerges mm -hmm. from not being availed of certain kinds of opportunities, mm -hmm. which, you know, others are. And I think that we see it kind of doubly working within Hayden in the way that you pointed out earlier, right? These double or triple alienations and margin marginalizations right yeah. he's not just black and poor he's also black and poor and alienated to a certain degree from that black and poor community therefore that kind of enhances his sight right yeah. so that his vision is so powerful mm -hmm. and then add on to that mm -hmm. the kind of meticulous honing of craft yeah. and you get the genius that yeah. we see in hayden's poetry yeah yeah man it's so, so incredible. I'm thinking about um, the trajectory of people of African descent in America, um, these uh, modalities of survival, these constructive modalities of survival that uh, we have developed out of necessity, right? Because of continuous existential threat, be it psychic, physical, spiritual, what have you, but uh, developing those modalities because uh, out of necessity. And I think at the core of that is this ability to see and perceive because our very survival is predicated on being able to make an accurate read of our surroundings, mm. to know what, um, you know, during the times of enslavement, what the master of the house is, is, is perhaps suggesting through his body language and his action that he might you know, um, threaten a whipping, a whipping or a beating, um, to know what the police officer perhaps is, um, you know, about to do based on his behavior, his body posture, the way he's speaking to you. So this cultivated sense of um, a perception of awareness, um, being at the heart of these modalities, uh, also infused, um, you know, um, quite literally with this, uh, this incredible kind of, um, 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 uh, infusion of spiritual kind of resiliency, right? That is mm. born, that comes out of, that comes in the slave ship from Africa, you know, that we carry with us as these kinds of, 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 um, of mobile libraries, if you will, you know what I mean? Uh, so these kind of consciousness, the spiritual consciousness, that being, um, you know, infused and being um, kind of uh, um, um, welded with this uh, need to be uh, so observational and and perceptive because of the environment, the threatening environment that we were in. And then these constructive modalities, these incredibly creative modalities of survival being born out of that. And I'm thinking about the musicality, the tradition of music, man, the field holler songs, brothers, the spirituals. I'm thinking of gut, gut bucket blues, brother. I'm thinking of, you know, bebop jazz. I'm thinking of hip hop and all of these coming out of that tradition. Mm. And um, I'm also thinking about the musicality in Hayden's poetry and um, how that is an aspect of, um, of, of, of his work as well. And one can hear the, the timbre of jazz in, his, in the lyricism of his poetry. One can uh, you know, hear the uh, kind of tonal varieties of an artist like Romir Bearden in his poetry. And um, I, you know, I think, man, this is, a, this is a good place, man, to drop, drop another one of his pieces, brother. Mm -hmm. are, are you, down, you down for that? Mm -hmm. Yes, that sir. Think, yes, sir. I think speaks to the kind of um, uh, the musicality in his in his language, and this one I would love to read is uh, is uh, Frederick Douglass, man, which is is a really powerful one because you know we know Frederick Douglass in some sense re uh, represents this kind of intersectionality of of realities, a man who was a former enslaved person, but who rises to prominence because of his erudition and his ability to speak in front of people, which was denied, the enslaved person was denied access to reading material 
but mm. because of chance or providence, he is exposed to, um, to reading and then he develops the capacity to read and then he, his gifts honed through the public lecture circuit influence the entire planet. So I would love to uh, read this piece uh, called Frederick Douglass Man, which is one of my favorites. When it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing, needful to man as air, usable as earth when it belongs at last to all, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, when it is more than the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro, beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien, this man, superb in love and logic, this man shall be remembered, oh, not with statues rhetoric, not with legends, and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of his life, the lives fleshing his dream of the beautiful, needful thing. And I'm just, you know, that language, brother, which is so rich and so evocative as so much of Hayden's poetry is, um, the musicality of the way he uses language, the, you know, the, the crescendos, the quiet moments, you know, the moments that extend, the moments that contract. And I'm wondering if you can, you know, we know that Hayden was, uh, you know, his, his craft was influenced by a number of poets. Of course, he was influenced by people like uh, County Cullen, uh, Parlons Dunbar, um, Bon Temps, Keats, Auden, who we actually studied with, um, you know, and uh, also Yeats. And I'm wondering how, if you can speak to um, this, the way, the way that he fleshed out his craft, which has this um, the, the structures that come out of uh, poetic verse, out of the history of poetry, but then also there's this mu musicality in the language that clearly comes from the African-American musical tradition. And I'm wondering if you, could, if you could speak to that, brother. Yeah, I mean, again, just such a beautiful reading, Masu. Thanks, thanks for sharing that with everyone. It's, 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 uh, it's wonderful to have you kind of, you know, both your... Um, attraction to the poetry itself and then your capacity to uh, dramatize it in a way that's really sort of brings out, you know, so much of the meaning. So I appreciate, I appreciate your reading there. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to go back to something um, that you said earlier about this kind of like creative capacity within um, African-American cultural production right which is oftentimes like it has this it has this long history of a people coming to a new place without anything right mm -hmm. and then calling upon the remnants of the culture mm -hmm. that was left behind and that was that people attempted to strip from them calling upon that but then also combining it with this new world mm -hmm. material, right? Whether it's a new, this new Christianity, right? Uh, this new 
European languages, these new European languages, these cultures, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing those back to, to in this new world blackness, right? Mm -hmm. Combining those things to create something brand new. And of course, the most obvious example of that is something like jazz, right? Where, you know, the European instruments are taken and then turned into a brand new kind of art form, right? Um, and this is what black creators did again and again and again, right? They took like the hymnal form and they created black spirituals, right? Infusing these uh, existing forms uh, with new spirit and new power, right? And it's, it, it seemed to me that in the coming together of these kinds of materials, that's it's kind of like a spark, like there's a clash and a spark and a brand new thing is created in the world that has been irresistible, yeah. you know, for cultures everywhere in the globe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hayden fits into that kind of schema in the same way in that if you look at this poem that you just read, Frederick Douglass, it's a sonnet, yeah. you know, it's yeah. one of the oldest forms of poetry uh, in the English tradition, English language tradition, right? And it's oftentimes a, and, and so is those Winter Sundays, by yeah. the way. That's another faux sonnet, like yeah. a faux sonnet, right? And what he does is he takes that form, right? And then invests it with all of this kind of understanding and all of this vision that he has so that it kind of beats and as you said, expands and contracts as that's one of his, what's one of the things he's evoking in this poem, right? The heartbeat, right? It expands and it contracts in new ways, okay? And so Hayden was like genius at doing that. And then also kind of in, in inserting himself into a cultural tradition of, as you said before, like resiliency mm -hmm. of always having that vision toward the future, yeah. right? One of the one of those blue songs that's my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one well, of my favorite lines from one of those blue songs is, you know, the blues are always about, you know, trying to get through a difficulty. And there's this one uh, lyric where the you, you might know it. He says, you know, I'm I'm about to lay my head down on the track. And when the train comes round the bend, I'm about to snatch my damn head back again, you know, which is like, it's that bad, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'm going to not submit to the suicide, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to keep on going because something keeps on going. And, and sometimes something keeps me going. And sometimes that's the art, right? Mm -hmm. And in Hayden's art, we see that there in that Frederick Douglass poem, right? We see like a vision of the future. Mm -hmm. when it is finally ours yes. right and, yes. and 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 then as he goes through the poem and gets to the end right mm -hmm. he lets us know that it's not ours yet if we're just appreciating appreciating frederick Douglass through the poem mm -hmm. and not through live lives mm -hmm. right so even as we read the poem right now even as you read it and mm -hmm. gave such kind of brilliant um expression mm -hmm. to it Right. Hayden was embedding the fact in there that probably if you're reading it in that way, mm -hmm. we're still not to the point of freedom truly embodied yeah. as it as it as Frederick Douglass envisioned yeah. it. Yeah. And it's only when we actually live out mm -hmm. these embodied freedoms in ways that are perhaps even unimaginable now. Mm -hmm. That's when Douglass is visioning a world, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as Hayden puts it will come to be, you know? So, you know, Hayden had that capacity to sort of take in all of these ideas yeah. and yeah. then coalesce them into these kind of units of language, which yeah. are so incredibly powerful. And as you know, and we've been talking about, you know, really are, are, are just a, a, a uh, an inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, now what, 40 years after his passing still. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's um, so interesting. Cause you know, in, in some sense, his, his artistry was in, in a way, a time machine, right? He was, he was, he was um, um, freestyling man through, through time, through periods, you know, um, jumping back and forth, mixing and matching. Like he had a kind of um, uh, linguistic uh, set of turntables, man. And he was mixing and matching and layering, you know what I mean? It's so, so profound. And I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in his, you know, we're talking about his artistry, his creative genius, um, how it developed. I'm interested in the struggle that Hayden represents. Mm 
not just the creative struggle um, to make art, right? Which all creatives are engaged in, but the struggle that comes out of his past that revisits him time and time again, the depressive you know, moments that he had, those periods of um, just inconsolable depression mm -hmm. that he went through. And yet still some way, and I'm sure this has a lot to do with his faith as a Baha'i, right? And that being um, the method for him to uh, lift himself, if you will, out of those debilitating periods of depression, which were based on his trauma. Um, how, you know, and, 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 it's, and in some sense, right, his, his faith as a Baha'i comes out of this tradition, this tradition within the black community where that, that ultimate um, modality of survival is spiritual in nature. Mm. You know, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that has always been the practice. It, is, it, has, it expresses itself in a variety of different ways, but at its core, when we strip away the specifics of the expression, we come back to the spiritual core that allowed him to pull himself up out of those depressive moments, right? That would come again and again, we know throughout his life. And it's faith that is the engine to allow him to continue this difficult journey. And I'm wondering if you can, you can talk about that, brother, how mm -hmm. faith um, allowed him to continue to engage in the struggle of, of, of creation. I like how you put it back into that African-American context where that spiritual belief, that faith has been the kind of rock, right? And it has taken on different sort of permutations uh, throughout mm -hmm. African-American history, but it seems as though we can find that kind of anchor there uh, throughout much of the history. Um, and if we go back again to the opening poem that you read, those winter Sundays, you know, remember what the father is doing is polishing my good shoes as well, meaning he's preparing him for his trip to the church, right? And so although when Hayden wrote that poem, he had already embraced the Baha'i faith, right? He was acknowledging that spiritual foundation, which was laid for him by this father who he had an angst-filled relationship with, but yet still so deeply appreciated that spiritual path, which he set him on, you know, he polished those shoes so that he could step into them and then walk on that path toward ultimately what Hayden would come to believe in, uh, as the salvation of all of humanity available through Baha'u'llah's revelation, yeah. right? And so what's fascinating about Hayden in relationship to many artist intellectuals is that as the 20th century rose, black artist intellectuals, and well, artist intellectuals generally, and also black artist intellectuals, mm -hmm. as, as the 20th century rolls on, mm -hmm. we see people moving away from the church, moving away from spirituality, inducted into this kind of uh, rationalist, um, sometimes atheistic way of perceiving the universe, right? And so Hayden was one of these people who was schooled in that Western secular form of thinking, yet at the same time held on to his spiritual faith, but saw it evolve into this Baha'i faith, right? And so that in and of itself was a struggle for Hayden, right? Because he is deeply schooled in this thing that is telling you there's no God in the universe. This is a place of chaos. There's no reason or purpose to what's happening in the world, right? This is all just chance, basically, right? And so many Western intellectuals have grappled with that. And Hayden too grappled with that, but he had this faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so that faith, I think, saved him mm -hmm. from the ultimate despair, which he might have felt if he had truly signed on to this belief of absolute secularism, you know, purposelessness to the universe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, he's dealing with that, right? He's dealing with this just like existential kind of... Um, 
ex existential concern, mm -hmm. existential um, terror, mm -hmm. if you will. You know, he puts it in those terms in his poems, like it's terrible and it's terror, it's terror filled, right? This kind of possibility that there is no purpose to our lives and to creation, right? And so Hayden struggles against that and he does that by fully embracing the Baha'i faith. But it's always, it's never like, oh, I've just forgotten about these existential fears and dilemmas, right? It's always right there for him. And he brings that into the poems too, right? And that struggle as it's laid out in his poetry is part of what makes it kind of exciting and interesting and accessible, right? Because he's not pretending to be the pure saint who never had any doubt, right? Yeah. He is, he, he, he puts into his, into his art, right? Yeah. That struggle to believe, yeah. Okay. And so then uh, layered on top of that is all that difficulty of experience that you yeah. talked about from his childhood. Right. Yeah. So yeah. he's also dealing with this feeling of being abandoned by his, you know, his original family and then the abuse that he dealt with from his adopted family. Right. Mm -hmm. And these things made him, a, you know, it, it gave him a harrowing Mm -hmm. spiritual inner world, you know, and again, these kinds of struggles are sometimes that which creates great art. And as he struggled against these demons within, right, he has one poem where he says, you know, I'm awake again, unable to sleep or pray, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When he, he, he says that, uh, uh, and he's putting that struggle mm -hmm. when he can't sleep or pray into his poetry, yeah. Right. And trying to work it out in those terms. And that's what gives it some of its vitality, I think. Yeah. Wow. Man, you know, I, so much of what you shared that, that, that is sparking um, so many thoughts for me. He's an artist of faith. Right. He's also um, a lot of his accolades, um, a lot of the things that he's most known for being the first, quote unquote, black poet laureate of the United States. Many of these things are happening around the late 60s, the early 70s. And we're noticing at that point historically that the uh, black consciousness is taking a shift, right? From the kind of peaceful protest of nonviolent social engagement mm. to, um, if you will, a more militant black separatist uh, philosophical uh, ideological stance. And, um, and Hayden is not going there. He is framed within the context of his Baha'i belief is Baha'i principle, which is about the oneness of mankind. So in some sense, some sense he stands in opposition, right? Um, ideologically, philosophically, to that um, shift in terms of the movement. And boy, did he catch hell as a result of that. I mean, we know that he caught hell. So um, I, I, I just, I am constantly, I, I find Hayden to be like an onion, man. I'm peeling back these layers. And each time I'm peeling back a layer and delving further and further into him, I am um, profoundly grateful for not only his creativity, his genius, but also his faith, his fortitude, his ability to stand in a crucible of test and difficulty. And um, dealing in a, in a very um, you know, um, visceral way with those challenges and still to come out on the other side um, intact, if you will, and aspiring to move to a higher and higher level. And it's ironic that he was raised in a place called Paradise Valley and his embrace of the Baha'i faith about seeking a different type of paradise. Paradise Valley being a place of deprivation, a place of poverty, um, a place of um, dehumanization, if you will. Um, and his artistry or his, his, his love of books and reading coming out of that cauldron and then that being fused with the profound, the prophetic teachings of Baha'u'llah and pointing in a direction of a different type of paradise, which is about spiritual transcendence and transformation. So with that, brother, I just want to thank you, man, so much for being present and sharing um, just your knowledge, your understanding of the wealth of um, investigation that you've done around this extraordinary artist and this man, his complexity, his uh, majesty, and also his... Um, you know, his struggles and his frailties. And uh, I just really appreciate you, brother, sharing and being, and being present for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Appreciate you, brother.
Man, it's wonderful to be here. And, and it's really great to see someone who has such a set of a profound appreciation for Hayden and is able to express it so beautifully. So, you know, I'm just I'm just uh, happy to have been here. This is one of the, the, the most uh, intense and meaningful conversations about Hayden I've had in a long, long time. So I really appreciate you, brother. You know how it is, man. We'll go out on this last poem by uh, uh, that, that I have from Hayden. It's called Baha'u'llah in the Garden of Rizwan. And it's about Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the faith. And uh, we'll end with that. And then I'm going to have to exit. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, my very esteemed colleague, <laughs> Lely Mafayan. So uh, we'll go out with this. Baha'u'llah in the Garden of Rizwan. Agonies confirm his hour and swords like compass needles turn towards his heart. The midnight air is forested with presences that shelter him and sheltering praise. The aural darkness, which is God and sing the word made flesh again in him. Eternal exile whose return epiphanies repeatedly foretell. He watches in a borrowed garden, prays, and sleepers toss upon their armored beds, half roused by golden knocking at the doors of consciousness. Energies like angels dance, glorias of recognition. Within the rock, the undiscovered suns release their light. I'm Robert Hayden, Baha'u'llah in the Garden of Rizwan. Thank you, Laylee. Thank you, Derek, again. Love to you both. I will see y'all next time. Uh, that was wonderful. Masood really brought those poems to life. And Derek, you gave us so much background. I know a lot of us have heard of Robert Hayden, but really got a wealth of information today that I'm sure most of us didn't have before. We got some really good questions in the question box. But before we even start with those, I just want to ask you, how did you get into the study of Robert Hayden? Can you give a little bit of the backstory of your own journey to this scholarship? Sure. Uh, I was in grad school and, you, you know, I was a really unprepared graduate student. I kind of, you know, I, I graduated from uh, college really with an English degree and sort of trying to figure out what I would do. So I said, well, let me see if I could uh, get into a PhD program. So I happened to get in and I was really, as I said, unprepared. I didn't know what to do when I got there. And so I was kind of looking around for, um, you know, subject matter that I could focus on for a dissertation. And it kind of struck me, well, I was interested in both African American and Caribbean literature. Um, and I was trying to decide, well, which way I, which way I was going to uh, focus. And then I said, well, you know what, let me let me deal with Robert Hayden, because um, although there was a great book that had been written about him by uh, John Hatcher, I felt as though, you know, maybe there was something for me to learn there. And what I was uh, fortunate to be able to do was spend a lot of time in uh, writing that dissertation, discovering uh, not just many things about uh, Hayden's poetry, but about myself and my own kind of relationship to some of the questions that were so deeply important to Hayden. So it was really a bounty for me to have Hayden as a kind of almost a intellectual and spiritual tutor, if you will, you know, through the poetry. So uh, it was in grad school that I kind of gravitated toward him because, you know, of his strong belief in the Baha'i faith and also the, you know, the masterful poetic uh, 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 work that he gave us. And so it was like in that confluence of things that sort of really drew me uh, to, to, uh, to Hayden. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a beautiful story. It's great to learn. It sounds like you remained open and, and received the inspiration to study him. Now, I know you have a new book out. And before we get to the questions, I just want to give you an opportunity while the book is up on the screen to say a few words about your new book. What's in there? 
Well, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, the book is, it, it, it kind of emerged from that dissertation that I wrote when I was in grad school. But uh, one of the things that, that, that happened uh, in the years following uh, my doctoral study was a real shift in the way that I thought about Hayden. Because as Masood was uh, implying earlier, there was this conflict between Hayden and the other younger militant poets of the late 1960s and early, and early 1970s. And what had happened in the description of this literary history was a kind of contest between Hayden and these other poets. So it's like Hayden was over here and some people loved him and some people hated him and the militants were over there and some people loved them and some people hated them. And then Hayden was put to battle with these uh, poets in the way that the history was written. So, so because of some things that happened and some things that I began to realize, I figured out that a more productive, generative way of thinking about Hayden was not in these competitive terms, but looking at these other poets and Hayden in relationship to one another and discovering where they found points of commonality. And as I looked at those points of commonality, then I was able to make a finer distinction on, or I was able to bring, I think, some finer points into the distinctions that were existing between them. So I feel as though the book is opening up um, African-American poetic history in a way that hadn't really been done before because I took this new approach to it. So although the book is about Hayden, it's in many ways about African-American cultural history and particularly African-American poetic history, uh, primarily spanning the 20th century and then into the contemporary moment. Um, so I tried to sort of have Hayden at the center of this book while also taking a broad sweeping view of um, you know, what we could say about African-American uh, poetry of the last 120 years or so. Hmm. Sounds like a powerful volume. I love the cover. Another questioner says, this is Ray Hudson. He says, Robert Hayden had such a vast generosity of heart. It overflows in one of my favorite poems, Aunt Jemima of the Ocean Waves. Is such generosity contagious? Is that what his greatest poems accomplish? Yeah, I mean, I think that that sort of generosity is, uh, it is an elemental part of Hayden, right? And, 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 and he, he was always seeking for... Uh, truth, right? He was seeking for truth. He was not pursuing agendas in his poetry, right? And so as he sought truth, which he, you know, which ultimately could, I think, in his mature career be understood as ideas that emanate from the reality of all humanity being of one family, right? Uh, as he sought that kind of truth, he had to take a generous, if you will, approach to all figures and, um, you know, all subjects that he dealt with. He was never interested in dogmatic kinds of ideas or arguments in the poems. And therefore, uh, I think that that generosity, which, uh, the, which the audience member sort of brings up, is definitely something that we feel, you know, in all parts of his corpus. So, um, I would, I would definitely, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I know that earlier in the program, we were talking about some of the musical and artistic influences or people in parallel and so on. And Paul Mantle has asked, wondering about the incredibly rich legacy of gospel music as an influence on Hayden. Is there any connection there or anything more you can say about um, how he may have related to that, that aesthetic or that specific form of music? Mm -hmm. Well, there's several places where we can see, like, uh, let's say an earlier uh, a black spiritual music tradition come in, which is the, you know, what we sometimes refer to as the Negro spirituals, right? Um, there are some poems such as uh, Runagate, Runagate, where he uh, deals with the idea of the uh, escaping enslaved person, the person who is seeking freedom on the Underground Railroad. And in this 
in this kind of panoramic view of the runaway, um, he inserts moments from the Negro spirituals as a kind of contextualizing uh, force that you could say uh, carries along the runagate, you know? Um, and so there we see uh, the music sort of come in. There are other elements, there are other poems uh, where you can see uh, the kind of the, the beauty and the pathos of the music being uh, uh, sort of memorialized in the poems. And you will see snatches, splinters of well-known uh, songs appear here and there uh, in the poetry. And of course, uh, he's also thinking about that in sort of relationship to the church. And in several of his poems, he uh, there's one poem called The Witch Doctor, you know, and The Witch Doctor is kind of like his very um, ironic but deep and almost ad, ad, um, admiring view of like the black preacher of the church, right, who is encircled by the choir and the gospel, which kind of lifts him up in this performance, right? But then Hayden is kind of like, he's, he's, he wants to make sure that he's not beguiled by the performance, even as he admires it, right? And so uh, this gospel music is kind of like understood in that context. And, you know, like, Hayden was never, he, he, he oftentimes was looking for the subtlety, right? So he looked at the way that the music was uh, part of this folk life that he often would speak of, like the folk life that he um, experienced, right? But he was also interested in other forms of music, like classical music, right? His wife, Irma Hayden, was a classical pianist, right? And so, you know, he was interested in sort of the juxtapositions and the uh, interweaving, I think, of some of these musical traditions. So, yeah, the gospel is there, the Negro spiritual is, are, are there, but so is uh, some of this other, what we might think of as European music, we see snatches of that uh, enter his poetry as well. It's interesting that you mentioned Runnegate, Runnegate, because Paulette Trail wrote in the uh, Q&A box that says, Runnegate, Runnegate fully demonstrates his vision. So that's mm. something that someone mentioned. All right, another person has asked, um, how much do we know of Robert Hayden's writing process? This is an anonymous attendee who's asking this, but he said, wondering if Hayden is becoming more well-known now and rather than in his time, and how much do we know of his writing process? Well, as I said before, right, he was someone who honed his craft, like, uh, to a fault, let's say, you know? If you pick up the collected volume of uh, Hayden's poems, it's pretty thin. You know, and that's not because he wasn't, you know, genius. It was because he was so self-critical, right? And so he would revise and revise and revise for years and years and years. Even some of his most well-known poems, for example, Middle Passage, which is about um, the transatlantic slave trade and which is one of his most well-known historical poems that was, you know, received accolades, uh, uh, throughout uh, his, his later career, he was never satisfied with that poem, right? And he would talk in some interviews about he's going to go back, he wanted to go back to the end and make some revisions, right? So he had this kind of uh, ongoing uh, process of uh, revising that would see him returning again and again to words and sentences uh, just to get, you know, as the poet's challenge is, to get the perfect pitch, the perfect syntax, the perfect meaning. Um, so he would write and then return, you know, so it wasn't, he wasn't one of these kind of people who would just like sit down one night and just like let out a poem and then publish it the next month. That was never his process at all. It, it took a long time for him to come to uh, a place of comfort with his poetry. And one of the things that's kind of, uh, you know, ironic about this process is like he wrote a, a book of poems, Heart Shaped in the Dust, uh, in his uh, early years, uh, in his 20s. Um, and eventually he expressed the wish that all existing copies of the book would be burned because he was so ashamed of the writing in it, you know, incredibly self-critical artist. Mm. 
Well, that leads to a question that um, I'm sure a lot of people have. This person, uh, Sheila Gutman says, I haven't read Robert Hayden. Which book of his poetry do you recommend for a first time reader? Oh, definitely the collected poems, right? Because uh, those are primarily, you know, the, the poems that Hayden himself chose, you know, to be in this, in this sort of representation of his body of work. And so that would be the place to go. Um, and, uh, um, you know, f for anyone who's sort of first encountering Hayden's work. And in fact, I think most people come to Hayden in that way. Uh, there are only, you know, a few people, perhaps uh, more scholarly kind of people who will go through the individual volumes uh, that he produced, you know, from beginning in the 1940s up until 1980. Sheila has asked a follow-up question, which I think is interesting. Um, she says, what's your feeling about why he was so self-critical of his work? Well, um, I mean, I can, you know, that would be speculative, right? I mean, I, I can imagine that someone uh, like Hayden who experiences a kind of alienation and a kind of precarious uh, uh, adolescence, right, would want to, would, would have a great deal of concern about self-presentation, right? Perhaps the threat of or, or the perhaps the outcomes of not presenting oneself in a favorable manner uh, not presenting oneself in a way that would guard against particular kinds of threats in the environment would be seen as uh, you know on some deep psychological level uh, as inappropriate or even dangerous, right? So I think that Hayden uh, may have been so self-critical because of um, the way in which he used art to sort of shore himself up, to bear himself through situations of perhaps what he experienced at an emotional level as extreme threat. So under those kinds of circumstances, I assume like he didn't want to at all be perceived as um, open to critique. I think that when he received criticism, it was very, it was very hard for him. He was not one of these kind of people who could just sort of you know, brush off any kind of critique. He was so sensitive to the world, right? And that's part of what made him such a kind of a genius writer is that his sensitivity uh, to uh, uh, the world, like these hyper, hyper attuned antenna, which probably sort of emanated from him in all these kind of capacities, um, made him able to channel the stimuli of the world into great art. But it also, I think, made him particularly sensitive to um, perhaps harm and critique and that kind of thing. And this is why I think that the conflict that he had with some of the younger poets, the militant poets who critiqued him in uh, the 1960s and 70s was so uh, impactful on him because he was so sensitive, right? He couldn't just brush it off. And that then goes back to the point that Masood was making earlier about like how we have to sort of appreciate his commitment to these ideals of sort of universalism, right? A kind of common human family to which he felt himself committed, right? Like he didn't do that lightly. That was not like an easy um, commitment for him to make. It was one that uh, was probably really kind of, you know, uh, uh, difficult for him, right? That was a, a powerful analysis because that's something that a lot of people struggle with, you know, and to see someone who went through all that was still able to produce this amazing art uh, that, that moves the hearts and spirits of the rest of us. You know, that's, it's nice to be able to see that as a model. Um, I think I'm going to end with this question from Suzanne Maloney, because I, it, it sort of uh, attaches to a few things that you've said during the Q&A. She really appreciates your approach of rather than highlighting confrontation between diverse artists, instead gaining a greater and greater, deeper understanding of his struggle, the respect for artists for one another is an inspiration for the next generation. So she wanted to know if you had a few more comments about this particular issue. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that appreciation, right? Because oftentimes what uh, people, you know, in, in academia do, which is simply reflective of our larger culture, is key upon conflicts, right? Because conflict kind of stimulates, animates, let's say, our limbic systems, you know, and, you know, it brings adrenaline to the conversation, right? When we are uh, attentive to threats and we align ourselves with one group against another group, there's a kind of intensity of engagement that is possible. Um, and I think that as Baha'is, you know, we are seeking to build ways of knowing and look at strategies of knowledge production, which don't really simply key on conflict, right? But rather look for moments of commonality, ways in which differences can be um, sort of honored and transcended simultaneously, uh, where we can find harmony and unity, where at first on sort of this at first blush, we may see only sort of difference and uh, and uh, antimony, right? We're actually looking for moments of confluence. And so I think that this is especially important for um, intellectuals who are seeking uh, another mode of engagement, right? Which is not simply replicating the order of the day, which asks of you, you know, to just critique other arguments, right? Uh, and you build your own argument by critiquing others. I think that uh, there are different ways of knowledge production, which are meant to be sort of generative and productive, and which bring out commonality in the search for truth, rather than um, highlighting, perhaps needlessly or over with over with 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 too much enthusiasm conflict right so uh i'm i'm a i i try to do that in, in my scholarship to what to the degree that i can and i appreciate uh people who appreciate that <laughs> yeah, well i appreciate you're saying that because it is a new way of being in the world and trying to make transformation and anything that makes it visible and accessible to others is of great value so ending there, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for this important chat about Robert Hayden. I want to thank Derek again. I want to thank Masood, even though he's already stepped out. And I want to say, if you were captivated by this discussion, don't forget to check out Derek's new book, Robert Hayden in Verse, New Histories of African-American Poetry and the Black Arts Era. I learned a lot today. Like I said, I knew who Robert Hayden was, but today you really filled in my knowledge. I've enjoyed the conversation and I hope everybody else has. And I want to thank the audience for your great questions. If you'd like a one-on-one -on -one virtual guide to answer questions and lead you to your own personal investigation of the Baha'i faith, please email info at baha'i.chat and write guide in the subject line. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.